Hey, I'm Bert, and welcome to Season 2 of Dabbing with Washington Artists. If you're new to the show, the idea is simple. Six questions, six dabs. So pull up a chair, light your torches, as we interview the artists that make Washington, Washington. Hi, uh, I'm Kamaki, Elizabeth Kamaki. You can find me at Seaweed Seed, uh, Seaweed X Seed on Instagram. And I'm here on Dabbing with Washington Artists, which is what I have, you will see me do here, which I've already done, but you don't know how the magic of editing works. Or maybe you do, because you're on the other side of that camera and you can know anything. So welcome, thanks for joining us. For today's series of dabs, we will begin our smoke session with a wedding cake, a Kimbo Kush, and a peaches and cream. And we will round out the session with an Apple Jacks, a Baja Blast, and an Alaskan Thunderfuck. Hi, I'm Bert with Immature Stoners, and this is Dabbing with Washington Artists. Today we are joined by Kumaki. Uh, thank you for coming today. Thank you for having me. It's absolutely awesome to have you. Uh, I love the outfit. Thanks. You know, I decided to wear every single conversation piece I had. And purple and green are my two favorite colors. Oh, so, awesome. like, you know, yeah. thought I should dress up with some good weed and also, like, have oh, things to chat about. Hell yes. Well, uh, if you're ready, we're going to get nice and toasty. Yep. How about it? All right. So for our first dab of the day, we have some wedding cake. Wedding cake is an indica dominant hybrid known for its distinct taste of sweet cake and fruit and its tendencies to leave the smoker social and relaxed. We picked up a gram of this live rosin at a dispensary on 99th Avenue in Bothell. There it goes. Heck yeah, going in for that double tap. This is really tasty. Yeah. All right, so uh, the first thing we like to ask everyone on the show, um, how has cannabis influenced your art or your creative process? Because like, well, I guess first of all, it's influenced my whole life because uh, you know I have a couple of injuries and disabilities and things, so I've been basically a medical cannabis patient since I was you know a teenager and not actually a proper medical cannabis patient, but trying not to take like opioid medications and things like that after having major surgeries. Absolutely. And so being able to live my life has like influenced my my artistic process so much in that way and Absolutely. like like and also I have some joint problems that uh, extend to my hands sometimes and so it makes it difficult to do things like sewing or crocheting but you know a little bit of the a little bit of the cannabis really helps with the pain and with the swelling and so it means that I can actually do the things that I love for longer uh, and I'm I'm guessing I probably know but uh, you primarily lean towards indica sativa do you have any favorites honestly I'm really a big hybrid person like I okay. feel like people do so many interesting things with hybrids and they kind of cover the whole spectrum totally yeah because i'll you know do the standard like indicas at night sativa before going to a concert kind of thing yeah but i just am really excited about hybrids because it's always something new you know i found that they're great for like if you have a job where you can get away with it you know those mm -hmm. hybrids give you that nice kind of all over everything mm -hmm. sort of yeah absolutely do you have any favorite strains right now favorite strain? well i guess like my first favorite strain i have to mention is maui wowie just because like you know, it, it always makes me really happy, and totally. like I like to feel great. Uh, I'm trying to think about like more recent ones that I've gotten into. I some black cherry soda that I got recently was a, a really fun one, a really pleasant one. Sure, we've had that fairly recently mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then also like flavor wise, I'm always a fan of the lemon strains. Yeah. And then I guess, you know, I got this nostalgia for Blue Dream too, that kind of like laundry detergent flavor. I've uh, I've been seeing some old nostalgic ones popping up recently. Yeah, like, I saw Sour uh, Diesel recently and I was just like, I never see just Sour Diesel as opposed to like, you know, Spaghetti Diesel or whatever, yeah, like yeah. 10 crosses with it. Yeah, uh, we saw like White Widows seems to be making yeah. a comeback. That's kind of cool. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, yeah, it's cool seeing all these... The yeah, ones like that I started slightly more with. old school. Uh, for our second one of the day, uh, we have one of my personal favorites, uh, some Kimbo Kush. Ooh. Kimbo Kush is a classic indica dominant strain that is known for its distinct sedating effects and classic indica high, and its rich terpene profiles of earthiness and pine. We found a gram of this sauce at a shop on Center Avenue in Tacoma. Oh, that is really nice. 
So, uh, the second thing we'd like to ask everyone, um, how has living in Washington influenced your, uh, your process or your art? Well, part of the reason that I moved to Washington actually was because of the legal cannabis. And so, okay. yeah, so it's kind of all a little bit synergistic because uh, when I moved here or before I moved here, I was living in Boston and it wasn't legal in Massachusetts yet. Okay. And so it was very difficult for me to just like perform basic daily life things while feeling like I was being a criminal, you know? Yeah. Which is just like, it's exhausting. And I just want to be able to like work and live. And so Washington has made it again, like easier to kind of just do, do whatever art I want. But I've met a lot of really interesting creative people out here, like since moving here. And Holy. it's meant that I've been able to like access different materials and things and just like spend more time on art and collaborate and work on like, you know, people's costumes for shows and other things like that, that have been pretty fun. Yeah, that's like, great. Like, I guess, I don't know if it would have happened or not, even though this is a national company, but one of the uh, jobs that I have is I work for the Murder Mystery Company. Uh, cool. Which is super oh, fun. God. And I get to do costumes for that too because I get to do whatever I want for myself. Oh, cool. And so, like, I don't know if I would have auditioned if I wasn't living in Washington just because, like, I don't know a lot of things if I would have seen it, even though, like, we are a national company. But uh, so it's meant that I've been able to get into, like, specifically 1920s costuming more, which has been okay. interesting for me because there are a couple of, like, flapper characters that I get to play. And so I've gotten to, like, go a little bit deeper into that, learning more about, like, the fashion, learning more about, like, what I like about, like, the sewing and things like that what I like about the design okay yeah and so I think all of that's kind of come from me living in Washington because that's where I got the opportunities that I've had that's really awesome and uh, how long have you been here I moved in 2017 and then I spent okay. like a few months of 2018 back in Boston because uh, I was in a show there that I was finishing up but how so, did you not pick up the Boston accent I'm just curious I'm originally like... from just outside of Chicago so okay. I could have picked up any number of crazy accents. Sure. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And didn't yeah, because I went to I went to college in Boston. I went to Berkeley College of Music. And so okay. yeah. Uh, and that's people from everywhere. So there isn't as strong of a Boston accent. Like of course I had a few like, you know, very strong Boston accent friends and you still do and <laughs> sure. Yeah. But uh, I, I never really picked that up or the Chicago accent. I you know, I gotta submit to you mentioned that uh, you like uh, you you um felt like a criminal doing your daily activities. Yeah. I had to, like, that's one of the things I thought about just recently was um, how much I actually kind of miss being a little bit yeah. shady about getting yeah. weed, you know? Like, I actually kind of miss doing, like, the, uh, the, the weed walks and stuff, mm -hmm. you know? Like... See, I knew people who were getting just a little bit too intense about it because to get dabs at the time, it was like, mm. you would be like, oh, these are concentrates. like, And like cops were like, what is this, heroin? You're going to jail for 500 years kind of stuff. And yeah. so like people had to be like mega sketchy about it. And I was like, I don't need to be like talking to your bodyguards like this is some like club from a 2000s action movie. Like this is weird. Like <laughs> I'm totally down for the like, you know, like sneaky basement, like friends older brother kind of like yeah, criminality. Yeah, Absolutely. But like this was like a like what do you have like a tiger back there too kind of nonsense. Two. <laughs> <laughs> so for our number three today we have some peaches and cream. And, ah, that smell just you kills said this me. This is the tasty turps. Mm -hmm. Oh wow, that is that is really peachy. Smells like peaches. <laughs> and that's all just like natural terpenes or. Uh, so I'm not sure what their process is, but um, I would love to see it someday. Right? Mm -hmm. Like that's actually one of the things. If you're a processor. Come on, talk to us. Mm -hmm. We'll get you on the show, because that's an art, too. Peaches and Cream is a sativa-dominant hybrid with a sweet peach flavor and subtle undertones of spice and pepper, and is known for its tendency to leave the smoker feeling creative and chatty. We scored a gram of these sugar diamonds at a shop on 56th Avenue in Marysville. You can also just tell it's, like, really saucy. Like, that's, like, mm -hmm. one of the, like... I guess butteriest textures. Yeah, yes. Oh yeah, but that tastes like exactly like a peach ring. Mm-hmm. Yeah, specifically like those peach rings that you get yeah. at, in the cheap, like, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Uh-huh. Uh, so you use a lot of uh, reclaimed materials. Yeah, yeah, uh, I'm a really big fan of recycling, reclaimed materials, any kind of mm -hmm. way that I can use things again. Um, so how do you go about um, finding the materials you use? Honestly, like, 
since I was a kid, people have just been like, oh, well, you like to do craft stuff. Like, here's a random old thing from my garage that I'm trying to get rid of that I, like, can't sell anyone, but, like, do you want this? Or, like, you know, oh, my grandma is getting rid of a bunch of her sewing and knitting supplies, so, like, here, do you want a lot of yarn and things like that? And I guess I've just always been the person who said yes to that kind of thing, and so people have gotten used to me saying yes to that kind of thing, and it's just Absolutely. kind of, like, spiraled out of control. But in addition to that, I do like thrifting. Like, I love thrifting. Yeah. yeah. And it's surprising how many, like, raw materials that you could get from a thrift store in addition oh. to, like, clothes and things. Because I do really love, you know, repurposing, refashioning, upcycling. Although I do have kind of a problem with the way that some people will repurpose clothing that's, like, perfectly good clothing that someone could be wearing and then they cut it into something for a TikTok video that they wear once and then throw away. And yeah, like I feel that. that. Yeah. And, but, yeah. like, that's the same as people who just, like, scour thrift stores for all the good stuff and then resell it at crazy prices. Like, that's also... That's, yeah, yeah. That's kinda, yeah. Not no, if you're gonna scour the th- like, yeah. uh, like I, I have a thing where I collect steins, mm-hmm. um, and I like to find them at thrift stores, mm-hmm. and they're usually yeah, they were, you can I could resell it for like a hundred dollars if I wanted to, and I yeah. bought it for twenty, but I'd rather just hold on to it. You know? Slightly so, weird related thing that's a part of my outfit, but I have, <laughs> you're just saying about my belt. I have I have a couple. Well, not yeah. exactly not with the wording, but I mean I've yeah. Got oh, my, I I got so excited about this little text block thing. I don't know if you can see that. But that is super. Yeah, cool, Yeah, it's though. it's from the Renaissance Fair, which is another one of the places. The, the Midsummer Renaissance yeah, Fair. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I haven't been to that one in a little mm-hmm. while. Um, we go to a lot of like pirate events during oh, sure, that. Sure. So we're, we yeah. go to like Tortuga and stuff. Like so I I work at the braiding booth at the Washington Midsummer Renaissance Fair for Brenda the Braider, and she does the pirate fairs and all the other events around the north that i've probably too. seen her oh yeah then, definitely yeah, yeah. <laughs> like if you've gotten your beard braided it might have been there might have actually mm-hmm. um oh shit then i must have actually seen you at a renaissance fair before. i only started working last year so maybe not me but okay, definitely some of my co-workers and friends okay okay that's cool um so do you feel like these um the recycled materials kind of add something to the uh, the overall finished piece definitely and i think i also just feel better about using them because i don't want to create more waste or encourage like industries that create more waste when there Absolutely. are already so many things that are like perfectly usable and perfectly like acceptable and like I don't know that we have as much of a culture for like rewearing and repairing and mending things as at you know previous times used to things sure. like that and I find that really interesting because I mean to be fair a lot of the clothes that we can get nowadays are, are fast fashion and they're junk and they fall apart yeah, and so you absolutely. have to figure out other ways to actually utilize that fabric if you want it to last at all but even then sometimes it just disintegrates absolutely but there are a lot of things out there that just need like you know a patch and then they're perfectly fine for another 20 years of wear that's kind of what i like about the whole pirate garb thing though absolutely. it's like yeah, it yeah. literally like ruining it is also kind of the way to make it look better uh-huh. too because oh. you know you're gonna come back and patch it it's gonna look more piratey you know? <laughs> favorite favorite costuming things is post-apocalyptic i went to uh, a wasteland weekend a few years ago i have a friend ago. that goes to those yeah. Yeah, yeah, I did that uh, the year before the pandemic, actually, so I haven't been able to go back since. But that's all just repurposed and then destroying and then yeah. adding more to it. Like, yeah, modern shit that you can just repurpose yeah. and, like, throw some sp- spray paint yeah. on. Yeah, like, there's yeah. some stuff on my Instagram. I, I made this skirt out of, like, five pairs of jeans that also have, like, <laughs> spray paint on it. Because it has a map of, like, the entire post-apocalyptic country that's and, great. like, a bunch of other stuff stitched into it. And, like, uh, the idea is that it was, like, if I could only have one outfit after the apocalypse, then I would need to have everything I could possibly carry with me and also all the information that I needed written down and like all the extra just like oh here's a like I sewed all kinds of pockets all over it so I could have mm-hmm. like little bits and pieces yeah. and they're like carabiners and d-rings and stuff all over it so it's like just in case I need something you know it's the apocalypse and I'm traveling it's the utilities, utilities. yeah, yeah exactly sure. Ex- like obviously it's a bit more fantasy too because of all of the decorative things that aren't super utility but it like ultimately is based off of something utility and based off of like reusing everything which i really like that's awesome that sounds like a lot of fun (laughs) it is like uh, there are definitely pictures on my instagram too that you can see of that and like some detail information and some of the like like fiber crafting tools that i made that are post-apocalyptic themed like i made a spindle out of like some nuts and bolts and screws and and i was using it to uh take this is actually totally related to the recycling thing but uh have you ever heard of plarn (sighs) So it's uh, yarn or, like, twine made out of plastic bags. So oh, like okay. The, yeah, yeah, the, like, really cheap, thin ones, because mm-hmm. you can't reuse them. They just tear right through. Yeah. But if you cut them into strips and then twist them together, then you can use that for all sorts of things. Like, you can make bags and baskets and shoes and hats and stuff. That's cool. Yeah, and, like, I'm glad that those plastic bags aren't as available, like, 
around at least in Washington yeah. anymore that they're the thicker ones but there's still those in so many people's homes and you can still use the ones like from vegetables and things in the grocery store mm -hmm. and if you don't bring those specifically to like a films recycling plant then you kind of can't recycle them yeah and so I like the idea of reusing them because it's hard to find a place to recycle them you can't just like throw them in your regular recycling Absolutely. and then they're also useful for a while because it, like if you throw them out then they just turn into microplastic and if you recycle them, then they maybe turn into one of those plastic bags again, but usually not, because usually with plastic, they have to downgrade whatever thing they're made into. A lot of people don't realize that with recycling, they do it on the numbers and how much money it makes. Yep. So, like, it doesn't it doesn't make physical sense for them to recycle the plastic, whereas yep. metals and shit, yeah, you know, it yep. makes them money and mm -hmm. they make a return on it. Yeah, and so I really do like kind of capturing that carbon wherever I can in my own life. Sure. Yeah. And also the, the plastic bag material is really great for making a lot of things. Like it's been good for like planters and things where I've wanted the water to be able to come through because it's just basically like a basket, yeah. but that doesn't disintegrate in the same way that a plastic, that a basket made from plant materials would. Sure. And, uh, you know, it's been fun for like sandals that I'll wear around like on the beach and I don't care if I walk in the water in them and walk right out and other things like that. That's awesome. All right, so we're going to be taking just a quick uh, CBD break real fast here. We got some CBD distillate. Dab three and a half. Uh, so, uh, yeah. And uh, if you guys aren't used to CBD distillate, it is fantastic medically. Um, you don't expect to get high off of it. But they do work very well in some one-to-one -one joints, edibles, all that kind of stuff. And I very highly, as a medical patient, too recommend them for body pain, anxiety, um, all kinds of shit. It's fantastic. They're also really tasty. They are, and actually this... Um, That's honestly more of my motivation for that than the yeah. CBD effect. But, you know, like, CBD is great. Mm -hmm. And you can always mix it with your weed if you want to get that high, too. Yeah. You know, you can always mix distillate in. Um, but, yeah, one of the things that I'm really into is that the entire hemp cannabis plant, whatever you want to call it, is great for a lot of things. Like, as a person who's interested in textiles and historical fashion. Did you hear about uh, hempcrete being um, approved by the U.S. government for use in widespread construction now? No, that's amazing. It just happened. So, like, that's yeah, so like, cool. so hempcrete is now officially mm -hmm. uh, good to mm -hmm. go. And so we're going to be seeing that rolling out here in the next couple of years. Mm -hmm. I would love to see more American hemp fiber, too, because yes. I would be able to get it from nearby. We're getting there. It'll yeah. get there, for and, you know, sure. Actually, if there are any growers who just want to message me on my Instagram and who are interested in seeing if I can, like, mess around with some stems and pull out fiber, like, contact me, please, because I think that'd be really fun. Actually, I know I know somebody who yeah. uh, who's just a backyard grower that sure. might be interested in giving you some of his uh, plant product mm -hmm. or plant byproducts mm -hmm. and stuff. Because I'm betting that there's also a way that you could press stems for anything that's, like viable when they're still fresh and green because that's part of the process for when you take the fibers out of any sort of fiber plant mm -hmm. is this the that's the, this is the next dab I'm just oh okay the, cool cool right um but yeah when you take the fibers out of any kind of like standard fiber plant like you know linen or hemp or mm -hmm. uh other kinds of like flax and fibers the first thing you do is you take the stem and you just kind of squish it like you pull it through like a pasta roller or something like that uh, or you just like pound on it with hammers. Mm -hmm. And I think for for something like, you know, cannabis stems, when you press that, you'll probably get some juice that might be interesting to play with. Yeah. Um, and then the the byproduct from that is like fibers and then also pieces of the central pith that are you just good for compost and things like that. Absolutely. And I don't know, because maybe people are already pressing entire plants, because I've seen that done for, for some distillates. We'll, we'll do, like, a whole plant extraction. I think that's how usually how RSO is done. I don't know if it's pressed like yeah. that, but I know that they do use the whole plant in that yeah. process. But so. I'm wondering if someone would be interested in, like, a fresh pressing and see what they could do with that juice, and that would be perfect for, for setting up the stems to be used in fiber crafting. Absolutely. Yeah. What I'd really love is to be able to just, like, start making, like, a fabric out of it and, like, you know, make some jeans and things, make some, like, cool. fun, fun clothes that people could wear, like, that don't scream, like, hemp in the same way that the clothes, like, <laughs> the, is, like, kind of help The way you can, you can spot a hemp, like, hoodie and something yeah, like that exactly. a mile away. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Where it's just, like, so, so we're at an early 2000s festival. <laughs> yeah. <just> ditch weed. <laughs> and that's the look. That is the look. Uh-huh. All right. Um, so moving on today to our number four. How are you feeling so far? Great. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, we have. I'm getting to do this tasting. Right. Yeah. Have a little 
you know, tasting board. Yeah, here, a full flight. Right? A full flight, mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, and we got some Apple Jacks. Apple Jacks is a hybrid strain with a rich, sweet, and earthy flavor and is known for its intense cerebral high that lasts for hours. We found a gram of these saucy diamonds at a shop on Capitol Hill. I think I loaded that one kind of full. <laughs> I got it going. Yeah. Sometimes it just takes a second. Mm -hmm. That is also really nice. All right. So you've um, talked a lot about uh, some of the um, materials and stuff you use. Mm -hmm. uh, what are some more of the um, more interesting mediums or difficult mediums uh, that you've ever worked with? So... I guess one of them would be something that I think we're going to get to talking about later, which is that cotton wall for the dress that's one of the most recently featured things on my Instagram. Okay. Be but that's mostly because it was just such a huge volume of the fabric. It was like 12 meters that I was gathering into fitting around a person's waist. Was that the pink one? Yes. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so that was like difficult, but it was more because of the amount than the media. I'm trying to think about like... I had some trouble with thrifted yarns, I guess, because, you know, you never really know what you're going to get. And sometimes you think it's like a, a reasonable ball of yarn and then you get a few feet into it and it's just all knots and tangles and things like that. Oh, rough. But one of the things that I actually do really like doing is taking sweaters and then separating out the yarn back to its original state and then making new things out of it, like knitting and crocheting with it. That's got to be tedious, though. That, I think, is why I'm bringing it up for difficult. Because I don't really think of it as difficult because I like to do it, but at the same time, it takes a really long time. That's kind of one of those things yeah. where you sit there, like, watching a movie or something yeah. while you do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, like, because you have to take the sweater and find the end. Well, at first you have to make sure that it's a sweater that will actually come apart the right way because a lot of sweaters you'll find are from a big piece of knit fabric that's been cut and then sewn together okay. and so you'll pull out little short pieces of yarn instead of one long piece like if you would knit it by hand right and so once you find the end and then pull it apart then you've got to take it and usually wash it because a whole bunch of horrible stuff comes out of these thrifted sweaters even if i wash them before taking them apart and then washing it also helps remove the the twist that's in it from the stitches that it was in while it was a garment. And so it kind of returns it back to a straightened state that you can use more easily to make other things. I didn't know you could just break down you know, like sweaters and stuff like that. That's yeah. Crazy. Yeah, as long as you know what to look for, you have to understand how the seams work so that you can tell if it was constructed from pieces that were knit individually mm -hmm. or if it was one large piece that was cut apart but other than that you can kind of just like take them apart and undo them and make them into whatever you like that's awesome like the beanie that i just ha wear on like an average day when it's cold out used to be a sweater that i then unwound and then crocheted back into a hat and people are always really surprised about that there's there's a picture of that on my instagram too actually i'll to look for that one <laughs> yeah yeah it's just a just a kind of blue and black twisted color it's okay. just like a ribbed like very basic kind of hat that's cool. But that was like what I wanted. I was just like, I, I want a very standard hat. I don't need to go and buy a beanie. I know how to make one. I don't need to go buy yarn because I have these old sweaters that I can take apart. And so, okay. That's what uh, I'm doing. What was like one of your most, uh, what was your most favorite piece to work on just based on like your material alone? Like, that's a really tough one. Actually, probably some stuff that I'm working on right now. I'm oh, yeah? really excited about. Yeah, and I have no idea when I'm going to be able to get pictures and things out for this. But I got sent a box of damaged, mostly vintage kimono and yukata. And oh, cool. so I have a lot of the pieces of that fabric that I'm getting to work with and, and making into some clothes just for like everyday wear. That'll be cool. Yeah, and it's really great fabric to work with because the, the it's still basically in pieces right off the bolt. Like there aren't that many curved cuts and things because that's how the construction of kimono and yukata generally work. Like there's a curve at, at the bottom of the sleeve. I don't know if that was on camera, I'm sorry. At the, at the bottom of the sleeve. Uh, and then there are a few little cuts right at the shoulders and around the neck but otherwise it's just straight pieces of fabric as they were woven and so they're very easy to work with that's because cool. that's part of why the garments were designed like that it was to show off the beauty of the fabric and do as minimal cutting of it as possible right yeah that, that totally makes sense uh -huh. for sure yeah and so like being able to sort of carefully remove these damaged bits and then use the rest for whatever i want because they're just like ragged and strange pieces has been really fun and also like a lot of it's had really like 
long, good, usable bits of fabric mixed in with like maybe one strip is like pretty much unsalvageable, but then the one next to it is perfect. And so mm -hmm. that's like, you know, 18 inches wide, I think I'm not. 100% there is a standard width and I'm going to be kicking myself for not having looked that up before being here you know <laughs> but I didn't know we we're going to be talking about this that's the fun part about the whole flight of dabs oh yeah yeah <laughs> but uh that'll be like you know eight or ten feet long of perfectly usable fabric because it was meant to go from the floor over someone's shoulder and back to the floor right and so that's like great and I can make a ton of things with that even if like it was way too damaged to ever wear as a yukata again because there was like a whole strip that was destroyed and and like you need to have jet or you would generally want to have all matching fabric for all of the different pieces because that's just how it's normally constructed like obviously people will do fashion things right where they'll like have a, a piece that's different for color or just like for design reasons but or for a mix of culture or something yeah sure yeah. and yeah so that's that's probably the material that I'm most excited about right now. Hell yeah, that's great. <laughs> All right, we're kind of in the upswing with some sativas now um, with some Baja Blast for our number five. Ooh. Baja Blast is an indica-leaning hybrid with a subtle terpene profile of lime and citrus and is known for its tendency to leave the smoker with an intense case of the munchies. We found a gram of this butter at a shop on Center Street in Tacoma. That does have a distinctly Baja Blast flavor. All right, so um, in addition to your textile and jewelry pieces, um, you work with audio, uh, including as a stagehand at the Showbox, mm -hmm. and uh, working on a program called Imitone. Uh, what can you tell us about that? Okay, so uh, I actually went to school for music, and that's kind of like one of the directions that I go with in art. I mean, like, at the Showbox, I don't do too much of the, like, live audio-related things. I mostly, mm -hmm. you know, set things up, plug things in, do what the audio sure. show tells me to do. Right. But it still means that I get to work with a lot of concerts, you know, talk to people That's about awesome. the the instruments that they're using <coughs> and the other things that they're using live on stage, and the, and the lights, too, which I think is pretty cool and, like, is a whole other form of art that I've started learning more about recently and mm -hmm. interests me. Uh, but Imitone is a software product that, do you know what MIDI is, like a MIDI yeah. controller? Mm -hmm. So if you if you have like a MIDI keyboard, then you're inputting MIDI data into your computer using a keyboard. Right. If you use Imitone, you can input MIDI data into your computer using your voice. So oh, cool. if you're used to playing a piano, you may use a keyboard, but if you're used to singing, you can use Imitone. Okay. And so that's been really fun to learn about, work with, you know, spend some time like digging around in the in programs with trying to play with it a little bit, like working with other musicians who are using it and trying to use it professionally in their work or for art installations. Okay. Because there have been like so many cool sound design things actually that sure. uh, I've seen people doing with it. Like we had someone who had an installation where there was just a microphone and then all of these like lights set up around it and you could like yell or speak into it and it was filtered through imitone and certain scales and so it music would come back out based on what things you were saying like just from the modulation and the tone of your voice and the lights would also like blink on and off and change color and things like that which is super cool yeah and people are doing all kinds of interesting things with controlling it with things like flutes or other instruments that uh monophonic instruments ones that play one note at a time like it's it not uh, developed for guitar chords right now okay but uh, because it's really meant to work with the voice more than anything it's really most connected to singing that's cool yeah and it has a lot of amazing things where like if you want to work on your improvisational singing where you can kind of pick a key that you like or you can pick a type of scale that you like like if you want to work on particularly the blues scale which is where a lot of people like to start because it's a very like, concise and uh like recognizable sound sure and when you practice with it you know you, there are a lot of different directions you can go and what will happen is as you sing with it and have your headphones it'll only play you back the notes that are within the scale and so you can sing close to where it's right and it will play the right note for you and so as you hear it your voice naturally comes to meet it and it's okay. sort of a biofeedback thing that actually helps you train yourself to sing in ways that you would want to sing. Is that kind of, 
I know this is going to be a dumbed down version of that, but kind of like when you're sitting in the car listening to music and you're singing along with it, you can hit that note a little yeah. bit better than if you were trying to just do it. Absolutely, like, because it, it's not coming out of thin air. Right, But right. the more you do it, the better you get at it. Like the okay. songs that you've been singing in the car since you were a kid, you can probably still hit that one crazy note Like if you're really thinking about it. <laughs> Whereas, like, a like a newer one, maybe not. Yeah, yeah. That's cool. Mm-hmm. That is such a cool idea. And it would be interesting, especially for people who are trying to do, like, vocal lessons and stuff like oh, that. Oh, yeah, yeah. We found a lot of interesting, like, teachers and, like, school choir teachers have been doing a lot of cool stuff with it. And, yeah, it, I, I can't say enough good things about it, honestly. Like, it's a really interesting piece of software to be working with. And this is something that people can download it. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's for sale right now. Awesome. Well, yeah, check it out. If you're a musician, yeah. check it out. I'll give you the link. All right. So for our last app for the day, we have some ATF. Alaska Thunderfuck is a classic sativa dominant strain with a rich terpene profile of lemon and pine and is known for its creeper effect and intense physical high. We found a gram of this terp sauce at a shop on Route 99 in Everett. All right, so uh, you recently had an article written about one of your pieces, uh, the Cottage Core Chemise. Mm-hmm. Hopefully, I'm saying that good. Um, and it was uh, fascinating to learn uh, about Cottage Core in general and its history. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you view Cottage Core in comparison to, say, some of the other aesthetics that you present, um, like the like the Goth aesthetics or you know anything like that? Sure, sure. So actually, I wrote that article and with my friend who's featured in the photos there, okay. uh, who is the the model and drag queen who helped me conceptualize of the piece. So like we really went all out with everything for that to like make sure that we got the information. Across. So I think cottage core is very goofy, but that it's really fun and that there's a lot of great stuff in it. Even though if you if you read that article, there is a lot about the problematic nature of the roots because sure. yeah, yeah. there there are a whole lot of issues with you know wearing a plastic bag dress to pretend that you're a fairy princess in the country while then spending fast fashion money on a different one of those every week and then throwing them out right and other things like that which are very popular in the like modern like tiktok aesthetics and like Mm -hmm. the idea of doing like an aesthetic like that Mm -hmm. and so while i love a lot of the things visually that come from it and like a lot of the things that people incorporate into their own personal wardrobes like i kind of feel like that about every aesthetic but don't necessarily like the idea of people doing it where they completely take over their life with that and trying to keep up with the content and keep up with the having the like something to show off that's like a new thing that's also within their genre because that's what happens with a lot of these people is that they Mm -hmm. they make a really beautiful and thoughtful outfit and like set it up nicely in a nice photo and then suddenly they're expected to do that like a hundred times a month Mm -hmm. and with certain like things that they have to meet for brand sponsors in order to be able to afford to survive doing what they love absolutely yeah and so i think that that's awful and horrible but that's something that's kind of more done to people than people usually choose i mean obviously there are some like rich influencers who just will buy and throw things away and i'm completely against that absolutely but like i think that would be obvious from any of the things we talked about through this whole interview it's one of the things i always liked about like the pirate community yeah. they have like a reverence for their for their garb pieces mm-hmm. like you know i've seen what happens when people lose a piece you yeah. know like they they lose their shit you yeah. know like um and because and, and, they're wearing real fabrics and real products and mm-hmm. things like that like, I mean, sure, plenty of people have things where they start out with, like, a like polyester or other just, like, quick party store things. But in general, people's hats, they're dropping, like, three or four hundred dollars on. Yeah. You know, the pants, too, can get up to, like, seven or eight easily if they're leather and things like that. And, and then if you get into the historical, there's a whole other, like, yeah. even further. I, I don't have the money to be historical oh, about no, it. Oh, no. Like, I'm historically yeah. influenced. Yeah. And that's as far as I can go almost all of the time. Yeah. And so we we checked out your Instagram and all that yeah. and all that. Uh, but for the people watching, can you give a kind of a just a quick rundown of what Cottage Core actually is? Like what it's. So I guess if you if you look at like a hashtag for Cottage Core, a lot of what you're going to find are things that you would associate with a cute country cottage, which could mean a pretty wide variety of things depending on like what country your country is in but it's like 
anything from like hobbit holes and like elf houses and like having cute little shelves that look like mushrooms sticking out of your walls to dressing up in like fun aprons and flouncy gowns that look good with the picnic basket near you and things like that like trying to look like you're from a ghibli movie like <laughs> is a huge portion of that okay. or trying to look like you came from some like old painting of like a pretty lady sitting around in the flowers kind of a an aesthetic as well like okay. there's a lot of influence from like historical but fantasy kinds of historical things like very puffed sleeves and uh like wearing stays and corsets on the outside of their clothing or things with lacing that okay. uh whether or not it's for actual like opening and closing the clothes or if there are zippers and things but like things that show that there is lacing um straw hats flowers vegetables that's awesome all of which yeah it sounds like it's a lot of fun to shoot especially in like the summer and stuff oh yeah yeah it was definitely a lot of fun to do the the drag shoot that's that's in that article uh because it was so many different kind of like it was a very summery outdoor space and then we also had like the kind of fall pumpkin theme mm -hmm. and the and the dress too you know is is also kind of playing with all of those themes with the poofy fluffy sleeves and the and the 12 meters of skirt and uh there's a there's a print around the bottom of the skirt that's peaches and eggplants uh which you know for for right. fruit reasons but also just because it's a drag dress you've got to put a little yeah. bit of camp and humor into it absolutely yeah um yeah, who who does the photography or at least for that shoot who did the photography i did the photography for that shoot really because great. we could not get another photographer and i ended up being our last resort and i think it great. came out yeah i was really happy with it yeah that's uh that's really fucking yeah cool. next time we're hoping to find an outside photographer and i'll just style but like it worked out and we we're really happy with it and uh, so the the person in those photos is my friend Mickey, uh, Abby Since, the drag queen, uh, who has been doing just so many interesting things with makeup lately, and you should definitely look into their stuff too. Sure. I'll, I'll drop their Instagram for the link pile as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, hey, that is that is super awesome. I got to learn a lot uh, from you today. Uh, cool. And thank you for coming. Thank uh, you so much for having me and absolutely. for the six and a half or seven. <laughs> no, seven. The, the CBD one is still a proper dab. Yeah, sure. Yeah, dabs. Absolutely. Um, and thank you guys for uh, joining us today. Make sure you like, subscribe, share with friends, and check out immaturestoners.com. We've got apparel. We've got a bunch of cool stuff. Um, get so the cool stuff. Get the cool stuff. We have things featuring animals and stuff, too, now. Animals. Y'all like animals. <laughs> animals are really cool. Animals are cool. <laughs>